Hello everybody, this is Johns Hopkins with Baltimore Heritage and we're back with another of our Five Minute Histories videos and today we're going to talk about Green Mount Cemetery and there are so many reasons to be excited to talk about Green Mount Cemetery. I hardly know where to begin. Um, it is one of the oldest cemeteries of its type and important both locally and nationally. It has so much history we could do 50 videos on it and maybe, maybe we will um, but maybe the most exciting thing is after a long dark COVID filled year of not being able to do in-person tours we are going to wade back into the water here with a few uh, in-person tours here at Greenmount this spring. Um, we're going to require people wear masks and be socially distant and we're going to limit the numbers but they're going to be real in-person tours. We'll put some information on our website about that. Um, for those of you who know Wayne Schaumburg, the Baltimore historian who is the tour guy, the Greenmount tour guy, um, he is finally taking a spring off um, but has given us his tour notes and we're lucky that an understudy of his, I think that's the right term, uh, Tim Fabizak uh, is going to kindly lead our tours. So stay tuned for more information on that. All right, Greenmount Cemetery. It was, uh, it was officially started in 1838 by an act of the Maryland General Assembly, um, but it got it, the idea for it got its start a little earlier. A Baltimorean uh, named uh, Thomas Walker um, uh, visited, Green, uh, visited Mount Auburn Cemetery up outside of Boston um, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, Mount Auburn and then Greenmount and some Cemeteries like Laurel Hill in Green in Philadelphia and Greenwood in Brooklyn were all part of this movement of uh, rural cemeteries or garden cemeteries. It was in response to the overcrowding in urban cemeteries um, that were becoming a uh, health hazard. So the idea was to put uh, the rural cemeteries out on the outskirts of town, far enough away that they wouldn't be a health hazard, but close enough so that people could visit. Um, when Walker got back to Baltimore, he uh, got a bunch of friends together, uh, to the like-minded friends, and they bought the estate of Robert Oliver. Oliver was another merchant here. When he died, I think earlier in the 1830s, he was Baltimore's first millionaire, so he did quite well. And his estate here was called Green Mount. It's up on top of a hill. Um, incidentally, the neighborhood around here is called the Oliver neighborhood, named after Robert. Um, and Robert had done a great job of landscaping his estate. So Walker and his friends had a good start. Um, they expanded on that by hiring a gentleman named Benjamin Latrobe. He was an engineer with the B&O Railroad and a surveyor. They hired him to survey and lay out the cemetery. But lest you think that he was one of those straight-laced pocket liner engineers only, um, go take a look at the Thomas Viaduct, um, the longest bridge in America when it was built. That's his. Um, but also purely a work of art. And so he was the right guy. Um, and when the doors opened here in 1839, um, people flocked to it. They brought picnic baskets. Tourists came from afar to, uh, to see what was going on. And the cemetery was purely in the romantic spirit. And if you know some of the romantic uh, painters, big canvas, dark, brooding nature, that's the same thing that was being evinced here. And it starts even at the gates behind me. Those were by uh, noted architect Robert Carey Long, Jr. If you know the Lloyd Street Synagogue, that's his work. Um, but here the gates uh, evoke, and the romanticists wanted to evoke emotions, um, uh, awe, and maybe even a little terror. So behind me, these gates certainly uh, inspire permanence and history and, and even a little brooding terror. Uh, the romanticists loved it. Um, up inside on the hill is the chapel. It was done by another uh, noted Baltimore architect. Uh, J. Rudolph Nierenzi. If you know the Hopkins Hospital Dome, that's his work as well. And again, in the romantic spirit, this spire that literally goes up to heaven, um, awe-inspiring in sort of the most biblical way. Um, another great piece of work here. And of course, many of the markers and grave sites uh, are adorned with a romantic uh, era um, artwork. A few of the most notable ones are the grave site for William Reinhardt, one of Baltimore's most noted uh, sculptors. Um, his gravesite uh, has a replica of one of his own pieces of artwork called Endymion. Um, Endymion was a Greek shepherd. Uh, this is in uh, Greek legend. He was a Greek shepherd who the god Zeus gave immortal life to, but only if he remained asleep forever. Um, what, a, what a cruel uh, sort of choice there. Um, another wonderful gravesite is uh, Aruna Shepherdson Abel, the founder of the Baltimore Sun. His grave is an above-ground coffin made 
made of marble for himself and his wife um, with vines intertwined all around it. Again, this idea of a powerful nature. Um, and then maybe the most evocative uh, is the uh, Riggs Memorial done by uh, noted sculptor Hans Schuler. And here we have a woman uh, bent over weeping, uh, bent over a grave weeping, holding a wreath in one hand and a wilted rose in the other. Uh, if the romanticist wanted to uh, evoke emotions, I am not sure there's a better piece of artwork than this one. But not all of the graves and memorials are, are, are big um, or new, or I'm sorry, or old. Um, one of maybe the most um, interesting grave sites is that of uh, uh, Captain uh, Isaac Emerson, the founder of Bromo Seltzer, the builder of the Bromo Seltzer Tower and the Emerson Hotel, two showy, gaudy, enormous landmark uh, buildings downtown. But in death, he is uh, buried in the mausoleum with almost no fanfare whatsoever. So kind of an interesting uh, twist there. And I'm going to end uh, with one of the newer memorials, um, and that is to a gentleman named Elijah Bond. And if you don't know who Elijah Bond is, if you don't recognize that name, you certainly know what he patented, and that was the Ouija board uh, back in 1891. I think it was patent number 446,054, if, uh, if you're a Ouija board fan. Um, Bond was a lawyer here in Baltimore, and all the rage back then was this new psychic board that was going around, and he figured some but he had to make money off of it. Why not him? So he went to get it patented, and he went with a psychic friend of his, Miss Pierce, and, this, uh, and uh, the two of them went to the patent office. And the challenge was that in order to get the patent, you had to prove that what you were patenting actually worked. And the story goes that the clerk, um, the patent clerk, said, all right, you have got to prove to me that this Ouija board works. Um, you don't know my name. Tell me what my name is. Use your board to tell me what my name is. So Bond and Miss Pierce put their hands on the Ouija board. If you know how the Ouija board works, it moves around, it moves your hands around and spells out things, a way to communicate with loved ones beyond. Um, and lo and behold, it spelled out the words um, uh, Charles Mitchell, and that was the patent clerk's name. So uh, patent granted, and off they went. Things were good for about 30 years until Bond dies in 1921 and is buried here at Greenmount, um, but buried without any markers or memorials and apparently without a whole lot of record. Um, fast forward to 2007, and a gentleman named Robert Murch, who was a Ouija board collector, had learned about uh, the unmarked grave and spent a number of years trying to figure out which one it was and raise money to build a memorial, to have a memorial for it. And uh, after uh, considerable work, uh, he did raise the funds and find the grave. And today there is a wonderful memorial for Elijah Bond um, that is, of course, a Ouija board. Um, certainly uh, one of the newer pieces, but also the, one of the most otherworldly. All right, I'm going to end by saying thanks so much. I um, hope you can join us on our tours. Um, and if you can't, uh, I would just suggest that the cemetery is a wonderful place to spend a COVID safe uh, uh, afternoon walking around. And I encourage you to come on out. All right, thanks again, and we'll see you next time.